Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for a really important conversation today about the vaccine rollout. We're here um, thanks to the Public Interest Technology Program at New America and Future Tense, which is a collaboration of New America, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University that explores the intersection of technology, policy, and society. I'm Tori Bosch, the editor of Future Tense, and I'm so honored to be here today. We have an awful lot to discuss in only an hour, so I'm just going to jump in and introduce our three speakers for the afternoon. First, we have Dr. Helene Gale, who has been president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust since 2017. There, she focuses on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap in Chicago. She previously served as president and CEO of CARE, a leading international humanitarian organization. An expert on global development, humanitarian, and health issues, Dr. Gale spent 20 years with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, working primarily on HIV AIDS. She has also worked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the McKinsey Social Initiative, which is now known as McKinsey.org. And she also serves on numerous committees and nonprofit boards and holds faculty appointments at both the University of Washington and Emory University. Thank you for being with us. We're also joined by Dr. Atul Gawande. Dr. Gawande is a surgeon, writer, and public health researcher. He's practiced general and endocrine surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital since 2003, and is a professor in both the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Department of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. He's also the executive director of Ariadne Labs, a joint center for health systems innovation at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard School of Public Health. He's also been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1998 and has written four New York Times bestselling books, Complications, Better, The Checklist Manifesto, and Being Mortal. And though it's not noted on his official biography, he also spent some time writing for Slate where uh, Future Tense is based as well. And finally, we have Hanna Shank. Hanna is the strategy director for public interest technology at New America, where she works to develop public interest tech via research, storytelling, and hands-on projects. Previously, as a part of the U.S. Digital Service, Hanna was a director with the Department of Homeland Security. She is a frequent contributor to national publications and the author of three books. Her forthcoming book on solving public sector problems in the digital age will be published by Princeton University Press this April. So the four of us will be speaking for about 40 for 45 minutes, um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, you can submit your questions at any point in the conversation using the Q&A function, though I don't know why I bother to say that since we are all very familiar with the Zoom interface at this point. Um, so thank you again all for being here. Um, Dr. Gail, Helene, I would like to start by asking you um, to tell us a little bit about the work you did on the National Academies Committee to come up with an ethical framework for distribution of the vaccine. Great, thank you very much. And I just want to point out one fact that you forgot for both Atul and, and me, that we're both board members of New America. So <laughs> this um, <one> just... <laughs> I'm so sorry, I don't know why those weren't in the bios I was looking at, but That's yes. All right, anyway, we're proud of our, our affiliation. So anyway, um, so, you know, I, uh, I was one of the co-chairs this summer for the report that you mentioned that the National Academies of Science, Engineer, and Medicine was asked to do um, by CDC and um, NIH. And as many people know, the National Academies uh, functions to put out independent reports for tough and important uh, social and scientific issues. And at the time that we were asked, this was before there was any vaccine um, that had been authorized, and it was in the face of a lot of unknowns. So, you know, we were asked to pull this together, though, because um, we knew the, that there would be a scarcity when the vaccine was first developed, and that it was important to have a framework that would guide that. And so um, we had a committee of uh, 13, 14 people of all different backgrounds, um, all different disciplines to really do the best we could in the midst of a lot of uncertainty to develop a national framework that would then be used by other policymakers, um, primarily the, uh, the committee that advises CDC, the ACIP that advises CDC on um, utilization of vaccines once they're developed. And so we put together a framework and I would just um, point out that, you know, for us, it was very important that this was, this framework was grounded 
in some core values and then developed a risk framework that really looked at the risk factors that were characteristic of this particular pandemic. Because as we know, every pandemic has its own kind of personality and we wanted this to be very specific. So we had some foundational principles that we think related to this particular situation. One, that there should be maximum benefit um, in thinking about the allocation, given the impact that it had, not just on health, but also on society, that there should be equal concern because we know that um, the populations that were most impacted often didn't have the social status in, you know, think essential workers, your, uh, you know, uh, low wage earning health workers, et cetera, that we really wanted to make sure that there was nothing about where you fit in society that dictated where, whether or not you had access and that there, that mitigation of health inequities was incredibly important given the disproportionate impact that it had on communities of color. We then looked at a, a risk framework that we thought characterized the most important risk, the risk of acquiring or transmitting the infection the risk of severe disease or, or morbidity and the risk of negative societal um, impact, again, because of the huge overall impact that it had. And by using that risk categorization came up with the four phases that, you know, that we developed at phase one that had a 1A and 1B, phase two, phase three, phase four, with the idea that this is a vaccine that ultimately everyone should have access to, but in the face of scarcity, needing to have those um, uh, different phases. We also said that, again, given the focus on equity and the fact that um, communities of color particularly had been disproportionately impacted, we said that across all of the phases, uh, there should be priority to the geographic areas that were highest on the social vulnerability index. That's the index that CDC has developed that looks at issues related to race, ethnicity, um, income, access to transportation, household configuration, and all the things that put one at greater risk for um, epidemic disease or other natural disasters and that there should be priority geographically across all those phases. So that in a nutshell, and I won't go into all of the phases because we've, you know, that, that has now become um, something that people talk a lot about. And we never thought that the phases should be, um, that they should be, that there should be some flexibility, which we've seen states have really looked at phases in different ways, but we did feel like those basic core principles um, and looking at this from a risk framework would actually help us get to the people who needed this the most and that it would be a more equitable way of uh, distributing a scarce resource. That's fantastic. And I, I want to come back to the way this is all played out um, among the states, uh, how this is aligned with what you were hoping for uh, and has not. Um, but first, I want to get to the fact that this vaccine rollout, of course, or these vaccine rollouts have coincided with a pretty momentous change in administration in the US. Um, Atul, I know that you served as an advisor to the Biden administration's transition team on COVID matters. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the Biden administration was approaching the fact that they were coming into this in the midst of a process that was already underway? Yeah, it was made complicated by a couple of things. One is clearly coming in at mid course, which meant that making major changes, for example, you know, um, there wasn't a lot of uh, centralized software development the way that you would love to have seen, but now changing a pathway where everybody's on a different system is the way it is, right? And, and trying to upend all of that is difficult to do. Second was the, the lack of good information. So, you know, there are several things about vaccine rollout besides what the supply situation is. You want to know um, about the supply chains. You want to know about staffing and what what the, the federal strategy and policies are to make it so you have enough vaccinators. Um, you need to know what you're going to do about software. You need to know what you're going to be able to do around uh, billing and resources and enabling all of that. What what 
um, I found in two ways, both during the transition and talking to many states and, um, and companies involved. But then also in Massachusetts, I am a founder of a organization called CIC Health that has been behind mass, vac mass testing and now mass vaccination. And seeing on that end, we run Gillette and, and Fenway Park and a place called Reggie Lewis Track and Field, uh, which will be uh, taken over management uh, next week in, in Roxbury. The, um, those problems of just all the nuts and bolts, there were, there were, they are a source of costs, a source of slowing things down. And that planning had not been in place. It should have been four or five, six months. And so suddenly you're compressing into, you know, post Thanksgiving, trying to stand these things up in three weeks or four weeks. And that was clearly Herculean and we're still just in the catch up mode right now. Yeah, and that's, it was something I was actually wanting to ask you all about. You know, there's certainly a lot of criticism about the rollout and, you know, I think probably extremely justifiably, but a question I have is, to what extent are the problems a lack of poor planning and to what extent are they just that this is all really, really hard? Oh, I'll, yeah. <laughs> well, it, 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 the poor planning, I, I agree with Helene. Um, it's a combination of both. But I, I think that the thing you're getting at is um, we're now, you know, about eight weeks from that point where people really got things underway. And the vaccine rollout is now moving at significant speed. You know, we, we have 1.7 million vaccines now per day. Would have loved to have seen us ready to do that in December. We lost a lot of ground. Uh, but, you know, now that means that we have uh, around 40 million people who've been vaccinated as of today. Uh, we have popped into the top five big countries for our ability to roll it out. And that's despite a really broken, fragmented healthcare system where you've had to build a lot of uh, new capabilities that weren't there before. Yeah, I would just add to that to say, I mean, I think this, clearly this would have been hard regardless. And, you know, it would have been ideal to have more national planning, um, more systematic approach, more consistency across all states, less guesswork, all of the things that we know we went into this with. That said, this is hard. It's the, you know, this is the most complicated public health endeavor we, you know, any of us have faced in our generation and generations before that. And I think it does highlight the fact that, you know, we still don't adequately uh, resource our public health infrastructure nor are we what, were we well prepared for an adult uh, vaccination program. You know, we do childhood vaccinations really, really well, but we just don't do adult vaccination. We know that flu vaccine rates are not as high as they need to be. And so I think, you know, I hope that coming out of this, we will really take seriously the charge to um, fund our public health infrastructure and think about what does it take to have a functioning uh, public health infrastructure that also serves adult vaccination, because this is not going to be the last time we're going to need it. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, um, Helene, just following up on something on, so you um, talked about the development of the risk framework. Um, and I, so I live in New York City, where we are just plowing through um, phase one, phase two, we're now up to, um, as of yesterday, uh, people with comorbidities. And as a citizen and also someone who understands what's happening on the inside um, of government, there's like, we haven't finished vaccinating people in the other risk uh, categories. We've just moved on because not enough people are can get to the vaccines anyway. So it seems like on the inside, they kind of thought, well, we'll just you know open it up and see what happens. Um, so I'm curious if just sort of seeing how that's played out, if there is anything that um, you think the CDC should have done differently in providing the risk framework um, just around, and obviously I don't know like what level of guidance the state's got, but we'd love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't think it's as much the risk framework. We, we know that, um, you know, throughout this, that people who have had greater access to 
internet, for instance, when you need to find a vaccine site or use the internet to be able to make appointments, um, have had, you know, and, and all of the things, people who have greater access to health services to begin with, um, you know, have had greater access to, to the vaccine. And I guess there's a balancing act between the speed and getting as many people vaccinated as possible versus making sure that we vaccinate the people who need it the most. Because, you know, on, on one hand, we want as many people vaccinated as possible. On the other hand, from a, the standpoint of minimizing um, harm and also minimizing the risk of spread, you go where the disease is most prevalent. You go where the impact is greatest. And that's how you'll also have the greatest impact overall. But I think we're constantly balancing that because of the realities of the inequity that exists in our country, in our health systems, and we want to get people vaccinated. So I think we, we need to think about what will it take for people who come from uh, low resource backgrounds where, or populations where there is vaccine hesitancy for a variety of different reasons, how are we making sure that we're putting the kind of effort into those areas so that we don't have a lopsided uh, and we're rolling things out without thinking about the, the people who uh, have borne the greatest uh, burden of this and where the infection um, has taken the greatest hold. So I think it's a, it's a balancing act. I'll jump in a little bit on this one. Uh, you know, what's interesting, th there are, it to me has been how um, how much the state rankings about how fast they're moving the vaccine have driven the conversation in every state. Um, and so the desire to move fast and efficiently to get as many of the vaccines out has sort of been paramount. I, I, uh, I can't totally criticize it because of the need to, you know, this has been all about getting the people who are over 65 plus the people with two comorbidities who are the groups who are you know, at greatest risk of dying. Everybody was on board with uh, Helene, you know, your, your team identifying early on that healthcare workers, nursing homes, and then first responders should go in the, uh, in the first group. And then that we got to get to these high risk folks right away. The parsing out within them, you know, should we do all the 75 year olds before we get to the 65 year olds? That's been quite variable in Massachusetts in contrast from New York, you know, um, we had gotten, we had opened up to the 75 year olds, found that you got to 200,000 out of the 430,000 in the state very quickly. Um, and then where other places would have then gone to the 65 year olds and the people with two co comorbidities, the determination was, wait, we haven't got to the other 230,000. And, uh, and so there's been a lot of effort to move to those groups, 75. It's made people in the 65 to 74 year old age group very angry about not having access. And it's required all the creativity that Helene's talked about to get to the, you know, to the folks who aren't coming out of their homes to take the vaccine, aren't signing up because it's online, because it's, um, because they haven't, you know, gotten the message, because they don't have a three kids who are able to stand by their computer all day and, or, or make a hundred phone calls to get in through the, to different places. Um, the, uh, the one creative thing that came out of it, which has also gotten uh, a certain amount of fire, is the governor here said, if you bring in somebody who is over 75 and get them vaccinated, you will get vaccinated too. And that's led to people putting on Craigslist. I'll pay you uh, $200 if you're over 75 and need your vaccine. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think it's incredibly creative because it's getting people with means to work to get the people without means in through the system uh, on the other hand, I totally believe we need to be moving fast to get to all of these groups. I'm curious, you, so we, we've seen that sort of creativity, as you say, in Massachusetts. Um, other states have tried other approaches to try to maximize vaccination. But I think we also see a lot of criticism about how much has been left up to the state. So, I mean, I'm curious whether you all think that a, a, a more centralized approach might have been better or would that have ended up throttling the sort of creativity that we have seen at a state level? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I do think that we uh, suffered from not having a more coordinated approach to this. Uh, and the, 
you know, the role that the CDC plays and other national actors, you know, is to give the overarching guidelines to the states. And, you know, public health is a state function. And so states do have the responsibility to its citizens. And I think there, there ought to have been, and, and there has been a fair amount of creativity and innovation at the state level. That said, um, there is a role, I, I believe, for a stronger overarching, you know, here's, here are the core things that we will all do that will make this a much more uh, coordinated approach. And then within that, you know, allow for individual state innovation that meets the need of a particular state or a particular locality. But I do think that, you know, one of the things that we, that we could have, and I wish we had had more in the very beginning was a much more national uh, approach and particularly when it came to vaccine um, allocation by states and, you know, some of the just core infrastructure and capacity that is necessary to do this well. I wanted to ask Hannah from your U.S. digital service experience, um, you know, CDC built a centralized scheduling system. The states didn't want to go for it. It had lots of defects. Do you, do you think that those functions like the tech should have been um, centralized more or, or is that really, was it just bad execution or is it a bad idea? I think that, um, so, so the, the problem with the tech not being centralized from the beginning, the way that it should have been, the system that the CDC produced was um, retrofitted for another, for, for other users um, and isn't user friendly and wasn't, had, it has a whole bunch of reasons that the states didn't, chose not to use it. Um, and that presents a real issue because it's hard to retroactively centralize things like data. Um, I just, I keep thinking every day of all the data that is being missed out on, all the data collection that we could be doing at the state level that isn't happening. Um, they're in part because there's no centralized response and all there are all these different systems that are communicating with each other. And I'm not even, I think what is being captured is really the bare minimum. And I think it's going to be really challenging as we move out of this stage that we're in now where more people are raising their hands to get vaccinated than we have vaccines. But at some point that's going to flip and we're going to need to know, well, where are the people who have not been vaccinated? And the ability to track that at a granular, granular level is really dependent upon the data that we're collecting now. Um, so I worry very much about that on a daily basis, um, that that's going to be really challenging. And they are, they're, you know, the uh, United States Digital Service is, I believe, stepping into this, and there's going to be um, more coordination at the federal level. But I think a lot about what we've already missed. Yeah. My, my sense on centralization is that I, I sort of have to break it down into different categories. I think resources needed to be centralized with um, you know, funding coming through and that's starting to flow from the December package, but that was late to come out of $8 billion estimated to be required for vaccinators and, and getting to the large numbers we're trying to, only 300 million was mobilized in the month of December. So that was a, that was a big hurt. Um, the second clear area is staffing and um, the hospitals are already stretched. We see in our area, for example, in getting vaccinators that you have to both um, get, you know, we're, we're going state by state, but it could have been a federal guideline that said, you don't need to have a nursing degree or a full paramedic training, a basic EMT or a pharmacy tech um, can uh, vaccinate. And I'd argue that um, with appropriate supervision, we could be having lay people uh, being able to vaccinate with the same training. It's about three to five hours that we provide to the EMTs um, as long as you have the kind of supervisory team available. Um, the, uh, and FEMA now is starting to supply significant amount of staff and support as well as standing up vaccination centers. And that's a really big deal and, and, and would have loved to have seen that started you know, three months ago to five months ago. Um, the, on the tech, I think that 
my, my sense has been uh, that having clear higher standards around one you know data lake, which is what we have, and one uh, set of expectations about what information is included, you know, having half the states not supplying um, information about race uh, and gender is extremely difficult. You can track by zip code, but we can't track by education level to understand where the gaps are. Um, those kinds of, um, that there's an opportunity to upgrade and set standards there. And I'm glad to hear that digital service is potentially tackling that. But I also think that um, having one system that has to enroll, take in the massive volume of people, there, there, nobody has been ready for this and add in, be able to build the billing in. I think another centralized function is why we have to try to arrange for billing for every American from their insurer for $17 for a shot. You're gonna spend five, six, seven dollars sending the bill just have every insurer allocate that you know they're going to hand over the um, the payment for this to a Medicare or a um, HRSA um, in in HHS to deploy those resources according to who gets you know where where vaccinations are being done. I think that could have been centralized more as well. Yeah, and I think the other thing is just um, diffusion of innovation because. You know, clearly a lot is happening across the country and there are ways in which people um, are learning how to be innovative around this, but there's really no good mechanism for collecting those experiences so that they could be shared. And, you know, I think a lot of innovation does happen at the local level, at the state level, uh, but being able to then scale that up and share that is something that I think uh, would be better to build into the system as well. So Hannah mentioned something that we're going to see at some point in the coming months, a time when we go from way more people wanting the vaccine than can get it to people who are more concerned about the vaccine um, and are less willing to get it. Um, I'm curious um, Helene, if you could talk a little bit about how you, in coming up with the framework, thought about the sort of justifiable distrust of the medical community among Black and other marginalized communities, um, and how you think we can best approach equipping people to make a decision that they feel comfortable with there. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, uh, I think we had seven overarching recommendations, and I think three of them were around in some way or the other vaccine hesitancy. Um, you know, and, and one thing we recommended was that it would be good, again, thinking about the national level, to have a national campaign. You know, there has not been anything that sets the general knowledge um, and information bar for the whole nation. And we should be having a national campaign that puts out the facts, talks about how these vaccines are developed, what the risks are, what the experience is, et cetera, so that everybody has access to just the core information. You know, secondly, we felt that it was really important, particularly for communities of color, but not exclusively, but particularly communities where there has been this historic mistrust of government, of the medical establishment for very obvious reasons of bias, uh, discrimination, and real harm that was done to populations, um, that it would be important to also have engagement with communities and really thinking about who are the trusted messengers, what are the best ways to get messages out there, and do it in a way that respects people's dignity and people's ability, if given the right information, to make the decision that is right for them. You know, we all feel like it is the best thing to do to take the vaccine, but people need to feel that themselves. They need to feel comfortable with it. They need to feel like this is something that makes sense for them and their families. So really this not this two-way communication, if you will, how are you receiving what people's experiences are? And then how are you actually providing information that's relevant to them by people that they trust? You know, I often say that I think you know, Dr. Uh, Kazmekia Corbett, uh, who helped to create the vaccine, uh, do a lot of the research on the Moderna vaccine at NIH, is probably one of the best spokespersons because people seeing her 
uh, particularly you know, African-Americans, seeing this young woman who was part of creating this vaccine brings a sense of, okay, I, maybe I can trust this because there's somebody like me, there's somebody who I trust, somebody who I think you know, um, has my best interest at heart. And I think we need to do more than that. And I think you know, the third thing that we recommended was that there really need to be uh, a database and a research about, again, best practices in the area of communication and behavior change. Because, you know, um, health professionals are not always the best communicators. We need to really figure out what's, you know, how do we use communication technology in a way that really delivers messages um, so that they will be heard. Would any of you support compulsory vaccination when we reach that point? I'll jump in. No. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's very hard to, I mean, there, the, first of all, it's a um, emergency authorization, not a full approval. It is still technically experimental and we're still having to gather information and data about what, what's happening now with 40 million vaccinated in the United States plus you know, many times that many around the world, um, we're now not seeing the rare kinds of things that can emerge that are uh, dangerous or alarming. And that's excellent. Um, and that'll give people um, much more confidence. Um, I think the, the powerful thing that we're seeing that it's related to Helene's point is that we have not had the advocacy campaign that goes out and it's been stymied in some extent to some extent by the lack of supplies and the Biden administration is held back on saying, hey, let's, let's encourage people to go get a vaccination they can't get. Um, the, uh, but at the same time, what we've always known is that knowing somebody who has been vaccinated and your clinician um, and what they think about it are the two things that make the biggest difference. And as people have gotten to know somebody who's been vaccinated, that has made a huge uh, change. So we went from pretty high levels of vaccine hesitancy, and it's worth distinguishing between the people who are hesitant and want to wait or see more data and those who are actually against vaccination. But both of those groups, the vaccine hesitant and the anti-vax numbers were high. The people who said, I, I, I will not be taking the vaccine and you know, I, I might be taking the vaccine, but I, I want to see more. Um, those numbers are down so that we're below 10% now in the, in the black community and in other um, uh, groups that have been very uh, uh, strongly opposed are now less opposed. People are more likely to know somebody who's been vaccinated. And then the um, fear is dropping and the confidence has risen. That said, if you are reaching less people of color, they're less likely in those communities to know someone who's been vaccinated and you start falling further behind, which is the situation we have been in. Um, there's lots of interesting things to talk about if we want to get to it about what does seem to be working to reach those populations. Yeah, just to say, uh, I would totally agree. And I think it's more the carrot than the stick. I don't, you know, I think that it, again, it, given right information, given the right messengers done in a way that is appropriate, that respects people's autonomy and dignity, I think most people will want to take this vaccine. For those who have a reason that they don't, I think we should honor and, and respect people's ability and that, and also recognize that this, you know, to a tool's point, that this is a moving train, you know, where we saw huge hesitancy when there was no vaccine, when it was theoretical, and how that shifted once we had a, a vaccine that was so effective um, and efficacious that, that you know, it really changed people's minds. And so I don't think a no necessarily means a never. And I think we should give people the uh, respect to make up their minds when they make up their minds. And I don't, you know, there isn't a medical intervention that is compulsory otherwise. And so I'm not sure this would be the one to start. And I think it, it, um, it you know, there's, there's enough time for people to make up their minds in the meantime. But there are some, med like, you can't enroll your kids in public school if they don't have certain vaccines, for example. Um, so, I mean, there are, there are ways. You, you can actually get, I mean, there, you, you can get 
um, exemptions? I think the I think here one of the challenges we'll have is around healthcare workers and whether they you know they, they we have more and more healthcare institutions that mandate flu vaccination. Uh, so that they're not passing it on to their patients. Now, one of the things about the vaccine, we don't know that it reduces, you know, stops transmission. So, you know, at this point, it's only about whether you are protecting yourself from getting sick. Um, we believe it will also knock down transmission and we'll have much more data about that in the next month or two. And then the challenges will become, you know, the nursing home worker, the ICU worker, and what those options are. Um, and, uh, but, but we have to weigh it on the other side. Like, you know, WHO has not supported making polio vaccination, vaccination mandatory in, despite the polio eradication effort, because we've all seen it backfire with, um, uh, conspiracy th theories and other things that, um, make people think, you know, people are, th there's, there's a lot of distrust, especially in the Islamic communities about whether this is being used to sterilize young boys or other things like that in, in polio. And it's been far more effective to, you know, use every method of persuasion except coercion um, uh, in those kinds of uh, efforts. Uh, whether you have privileges um, like, um, uh, you know, being a you know, school attendance that has higher bar to withdraw from not doing it or um, flying in airplanes or things like that, those will become contentious issues. And right now, I think it is absolutely critical that we bring everybody on board without making them feel that they're being forced to take a still um, uh, a, a vaccine. We have a lot of information about it. it's clearly better to get the vaccine than to get the coronavirus. Um, but um, but we have more that we'll still have to learn. Yeah. It's interesting hearing you both talk about um, the vaccine acceptance as really societal change, like any, any kind of societal change, that when you know somebody um, who's had a personal experience, that that really makes a difference. Um, I think that's just an interesting parallel. Um, yeah, they, I, I think it reduces the fear because fear is behind a lot of this. And so I think it reduces the fear to see somebody, you know, somebody like you, somebody who you trust um, doing fine afterwards. And I think it reduces a lot of that. And, you know, I think the combination between reducing fear and increasing information, um, you know, a lot of the early hesitancy was really around things that were um, all, that that were more rooted in um, things that could be true. So, as an example, the fact that this was an mRNA vaccine, people made the link that there could be some genetic um, outcomes as a result of that. Well, that's not so far fetched. But it is also something that you can then talk through the rationale why, in fact, even though it has RNA attached to the name, why that is not genetically altering yourself. But, you know, and so I think there's a lot of the reasons why people have um, concerns that are linked to things that you can actually provide facts to get people to the other side of it. And so I think, you know, the the burden of proof is on all of us to make sure we're giving the right information, make sure that we're making it accessible to people. Because I, you know, I think, again, most people provided with the right information and taking out some of that fear will in fact um, opt to take the vaccine. But if we tell people you must, it is going to create a lot more of a hurdle than uh, providing the right kind of information to help people understand um, what the value is for them. Um, and I'd just like to note for our audience that in maybe five minutes or so, we'll be transitioning over to Q&A. So if you have any questions for our great panelists, now is the time to drop them into that handy Q&A box. Um, I wanna shift gears a tiny bit to talk about um, the other vaccination vaccines in the pipeline, do you think that we're going to be seeing 
you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine here soon? You know, are you expecting that we're going to be able to um, approve more soon? Or do you think that we'll have a different, you know, sort of vaccine regimen here than elsewhere in the world? I can jump in on this if, and then others pick up. Uh, first of all, Johnson & Johnson has submitted its data to the FDA. They'll be reviewing it uh, next week, I believe on the 25th or the 26th. And a few days after that um, will be a decision about uh, whether Johnson & Johnson's one-shot refrigerated lower cost vaccine will get approved. Um, and I think it will be approved and make a very big difference. The prospect of a one-shot refrigerated vaccine really changes your ability to distribute, um, including get to the homebound and, and others. Um, that's very important. Novavax uh, has had some very good results and is um, a protein-based subunit vaccine, has parts of the proteins in the virus that your body reacts to. And that is something we know how to produce and have produced in mass quantities before. And so the Novavax vaccine, um, I think they expect to be closing their trial in the next month. And, um, and that will also offer a lot of potential. The AstraZeneca vaccine um, has not been submitted to the FDA and they're completing a US trial. I suspect by April, um, we'll see results there. So we really could have five vaccines that will be ready to roll um, in the, by the time we get to the general public. It will provide much more supply it will certainly create a certain amount of confusion with people wondering, you know, do I take this one or that one and does it make a difference? And um, one thing I put in an op-ed with uh, several colleagues in USA Today last week was that when you get a choice for a vaccine, um, that you, you uh, the, the best vaccine is the one you can get compared to the coronavirus at this moment. Um, my biggest concern is the strains and the UK strain in particular, which is spreading rapidly across the United States, doubling every 10 days, 30 to 50% more contagious, and the vaccines are effective against it. So we need to be moving the vaccine out and making sure we're doing everything we can, everything we can to keep, keep the pedal going on our, our mitigation measures too. And so we've had a lot of criticism in the US about how all of this has gone, but as Noah Smith, in Bloomberg opinion pointed out, um, per capita, the US has administered more vaccines to our population than all but I think it's four other countries. Um, Helene, have you, do you have any thoughts about um, what the US can and should be doing to make sure that the rest of the world gets better access to vaccines as well? Yeah, well, you know, obviously, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, there is no such thing as wrapping ourselves up in some kind of um, COVID vaccinated bubble that the U.S. Um, that can't be per, um, permeated. So, you know, I think it's important for us to remember that we need to uh, also be thinking about the rest of the world, both because it's the right thing to do, because we have many parts of the world um, that won't be able to afford uh vaccination for its population and, and we have always been generous when it comes to global health but it's also um, you know so it's the right thing to do but it's also the smart thing to do because it's a global pandemic and just as we're talking about strains um, you know from the UK and from South Africa and Brazil and you know uh, we're talking about them because we know that they've already been introduced and they will only continue uh, to be introduced and so you know, it, it will make a difference for all of us to make sure it, we all, it's in all of our best interests to make sure that vaccine, vaccination levels are as high around the entire world as possible. I also just think that it is, you know, health has always been one of those areas where we can collaborate globally, uh, even when we may not be able to collaborate politically on other issues. And global health diplomacy is, you know, is, as it is called, is such an important aspect of our overall uh, global role in the world. And so, you know, um, I think we have no choice. It was the right thing that immediately the Biden administration talked about re-engaging with the World Health Organization, uh, contributing to the vaccine COVAX facility, all of those things that I think will make a big difference 
for the safety of the world as well as our own safety. So I think we're going to transition to Q&A in just a second, but um, first I wanted to ask all three of you a quick question, which is if you had the power to change one thing related to the vaccine distribution we're seeing now, either something really small to do with the availability of gloves or something huge about making it a national rather than a state by state system, um, what would that be? You know, I, I guess I would say, I, I don't know, there is no one thing. So there is no one bullet that is a magic bullet that is going to make this all better. I think time is important. And, and again, while we've all been frustrated by, you know, maybe a not perfect rollout, um, some of these things just take time. So I think one, you know, we need patience. We need, we need to recognize that this is tough. I do think the, the supply of people uh, is an important ingredient and, you know, a tool mentioned it earlier, you know, being able to train uh, a wider range of people to administer vaccines, I think is a very important uh, part of this that we haven't paid as much attention. And that includes not only people to administer the vaccine, but people to outreach to communities. So I, I do think the people capacity aspect of, of this is an important one, along with supply, along with a better surveillance system, you know, all the things that we've talked about. But I guess those would be some that I would highlight. I'll jump in just to say, um, I think actually the administration is doing most of the things I would want to pull for. But one um, that I would say uh, would be high on the list for me that um, I haven't seen yet plans about is really removing the billing component of, um, of setup. It takes an enormous amount of work. It's a high cost and it gets in the way of the resources and time for deploying the vaccine. I also think it blocks people from signing up. Every, you know, when you're coming to these communities, you tell them it's free, but I want your insurance card. Um, you know, we've seen this before with testing. Lots of people got billed anyway, and uh, it makes people very reluctant. So I think there's um, some straightforward things that we could do that, that um, access the resources that the insurers have in hand and have pocketed for that goal, um, but doesn't mean you're sending a bill one by one by one to every, every, uh, for every vaccine administered. Yeah, and I would just just to say, you know, that was, again, one of our recommendations in our report is that there should be no out-of-pocket costs, including the administrative costs, because that often gets forgotten and people make a big deal about the cost of the vaccine, but not the cost of administration. And it then means that cash strapped states, localities end up also being saddled with bills that are unnecessary. So I think that is a huge issue that, again, it's not, it's not sexy. It's not, you know, it's, it's kind of arcane for many people, but it's a it's big- so thing. new America. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Hannah, what would your one change be if you had one? The one thing I would love to see um, at the state level is I would love for everybody who wants to sign up to be able to sign up, um, whether, and right now er, the whole process is very reactive, like, oh, we got some more vaccines and so now we're opening up sign up. But we also know that we're, we're in the middle of a mental health crisis um, where people feel very hopeless. And I think that if people had at least a date, even if it's like maybe, you know, New York has estimated that my vaccine date is August fine. And maybe they're going to move it six times. Fine. As long as I know that they have me in the system and that when it's my turn, they'll let me know. I think that that would also, on the other side, allow the states to see how many people are raising their hands and how, many, how much work they need to do um, and to start proactively thinking about how to reach those populations. So that is my, you know, peace of mind for people um, and also starting to think about doing outreach. Great. Well, I have about 7,000 more questions for all of you, but I think I have to move to the audience now. Um, our first question, we got a couple of questions from anonymous people on Zoom about um, 
the new strains we're seeing. Are there any concerns, for instance, on the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine when it's not as effective against B1351? I'll jump in on this one. Um, right now, the uh, so yes, so B1351 is the strain in South Africa. P1 is the strain in Brazil. Both have some evidence of diminished effectiveness. Um, uh, there was a recent report from a study that's not, um, the methods are, are challenging, but raised the possibility of almost no effect from the AstraZeneca vaccine. South Africa has paused AstraZeneca um, routine distribution, but scaled up, uh, giving it to 100,000 people and monitoring what the outcomes are. And that study is gonna be critical because we really don't know. What, what I pay a lot of attention to is how effective are the vaccines in stopping what matters? Severe illness, hospitalization, death. And all of the vaccines have had uh, a very, um, very, uh, have been very effective against serious illness, including the AstraZeneca vaccine. The variants in South Africa and Brazil would be a concern, but the fact that, the, that for B117, they have been equally effective in averting serious illness means I would not slow any of them down at all. Right now, what we have is the, the UK B117 variant moving very quickly across the US. It's 30 to 50% more likely to put you, uh, to, to, to uh, infect you, it's more contagious. And there's also now much more evidence that it's more likely to put you in the hospital or cause death. And we need to move the vaccines as quickly as possible. Those variant, the other variants, we don't know as much about them. Are they more contagious? Do they spread more easily when compared with the others? And they just have arrived in spots here and there in the United States. They're not widespread. We clearly have to develop um, the, uh, the updated uh, multivalent vaccines that have uh, the ability to attack different versions of the virus. And those, those are coming. Um, our next question comes from New America's own Anne-Marie Slaughter, who asks, do you see a possibility to use the systems that we are creating to distribute the vaccine as a basis for a renewed and stronger public health system, creating permanent positions for community health workers? Yeah, I, um, yes, for all of the above. I mean, I, and I think those are somewhat separate, multiple different things um, in that, you know, clearly, and I, I think I said this earlier, you know, we really don't have a good system for adult vaccines um, like we do for, for childhood vaccinations. And so I think this is a good opportunity to really build that because I think we're gonna increasingly have um, diseases and um, epidemics that impact our whole population. And so I think thinking about how are we using this to develop that system? I also think, as, as the question um, implies, is that there's also a job and an economic component to this. You know, here in Chicago, as an example, you know, we've created a vaccine core that is uh, both um, helping to on the vaccine effort, but it's also a way of getting people who weren't in the healthcare system into the healthcare system and then thinking about what's a career pathway beyond just developing, uh, helping with the vaccine effort. So I think there's, a, there's both the health component, building that infrastructure, as well as, um, you know, looking at the economic. I will say, you know, um, every time we have something of a serious public health nature and we say, this is the time that we're going to pay attention to the public health infrastructure and it doesn't happen. And so I just think all the, it, I hope that we are really resolved this time to think about this because, you know, one of the biggest, um, you know, challenges for this is that we were caught off guard. We had not in, uh, invested in our public health infrastructure. And we would have been so much better off had we had strong surveillance systems, had we had strong testing capacity, had we had the kind of human um, resources and infrastructure that we need to mount a vigorous response. So, you know, I do, I am hopeful that maybe this time um, we have learned enough lessons and it's been extensive enough that we will go ahead and make the um, 
investments in the public health infrastructure that we need. We are getting a, several questions from audience members about vaccination in children. Do you expect that we'll be seeing vaccines for children sometime in the near future, or is that farther out? No, probably, and the, the tool you probably have a good sense as well. You know, probably within the next few months. And you know what? Um, often with with any medical intervention, it's first tried in adults, and then uh, gradually tried in um, younger and younger age people. And so with this vaccine, you know, it, the trials did not include children, did not include the pediatric age. And there are now trials ongoing that will look at the next tranche down. So the, the 16 to 12, and then ultimately 12 to, uh, you know, six, so that we will have that information. And we don't have to do it all over again. You know, it will really look at safety, look at how the immune response works in younger people, and then be able to uh, authorize it for pediatric use. But that should be within the next few months that we ha will have some of the data because those trials are ongoing. Yeah, the, um, the earliest one is Pfizer, which will have their results for their 12 to 16 population, uh, not until summer, they reported um, a couple of days ago. So that means maybe late summer, you'd see it for over age 12. Oxford just started the first trial I'm aware of in um, six-year-olds and up, so the six to 12 age group, and below six will follow after that. And the critical thing I would say that makes clear is we will not have the whole country vaccinated at the end of the year. We will only just barely be rolling out for the pediatric population. So vaccines are not gonna be the only answer and the only part of our response. We're gonna need good therapeutics and uh, continue to develop good um, treatments. And we're gonna have to um, continue to figure out how we maintain ventilation and do all the things we need to do in schools. And that means testing will continue to be a significant part of our uh, our world and that um, and uh, and I'm worried because testing is way down uh, as people get vaccinated they're sort of saying we don't we don't we're, they're not coming in for testing at the rates they should be so um, that's a concern and continuing to wear mask and distance and all the other things and I you know I think it just makes a, another very important point is that as as much as we know that vaccine is kind of the ultimate in um, in preventing, disease um, and hopefully also in preventing infection that we don't let our guard down too early you know um i'm fully already vaccinated. happening yeah <laughs> already yeah. happening you know, it, it, and, yeah. which is a big concern it's it, it's hard to get these multi-layered um communication right but we've got to make sure people continue to also do the things that they were doing before vaccination I think the really difficult thing, Helene, is going to be that we're going to have gotten to the adults and right. we'll see the hospitalizations, you know, below flu levels, right? And uh, uh, and once that happens, arguing that take off that, that we don't take off the mask, arguing that we can't just be normal again and be in concerts and everything else, uh, waiting for the kids, that's going to be that's going to be a big um, a big debate. Yeah, it's going to be tough. Yeah, along those lines, somebody asks, we've been told we'll need to keep masking and socially distancing after we get vaccinated. I've not heard much about when we'll be able to return to a more normal life. Could you give us some guidance and hope on this? Would you schedule a vacation for some time in 2021 or is that probably not realistic? I would ask. I'm waiting until 2022, yeah. but, <laughs> um, you know, again, I mean, I think it, it is the world, we're not safe until everyone is safe. And I think a tool's comments about the fact that children won't be vaccinated. And, uh, you know, I, this is not going to be simple. I know everybody wishes that there was a straightforward, simple, read the tea leaves, read the crystal balls, and we can give you an exact answer. This is, this is not an exact science. And we're going to, you know, be ramping up some things as we ramp down other things. And we're going to have to deal, you know, accept the fact that we are going to be um, kind of multi-dimensional in the way that we're thinking about this um, and know that we're going to have mo multiple phases of this going on at the same time. Not, it's just not simple. Yeah, I, I'm going to bet though that um, 
I, don't, I do not think we'll be able to eradicate the disease. And given that we won't be able to, if that's the case, if we can't eradicate it, then it's going to be something like an endemic flu that goes through the population and changes over time. And if the hospitalization and death rates are low, um, um, below flu, for uh, that, then we're going to have that challenging discussion that we did over, you know, driving 65 miles an hour instead of 55 miles an hour. What is the tolerable level of um, of hospitalization and death that that we, you know, is it zero or is it, um, is it somewhere north of there before we start returning to normal? And that's going to be, um, that's, a, that's not just a public health question. That's, that's a political question that we'll be working through. Yeah, and that's why I think the, as you mentioned, the focus on treatment is also important because I think, you know, we've kind of swung uh, from one direction to the other and not realizing that this is really about integrating all of the things that we have. So it's not all vaccine or all treatment. It's really how are we thinking about these in an integrated fashion along with, you know, mask wearing. I, you know, um, we know that mask wearing will help us with the flu, as an example. It, it, you know, I hope that you know, while I know 100% of our population won't continue to wear masks, that because people have gotten into the habit of it, when flu season starts, when cold season starts, that people will think, well, you know, maybe I should just put a mask because I'm coughing. Um, maybe I should, you know, not stand right up against somebody in the um, grocery st store line because, um, you know, this can help. So I just think we're going to move into a much more complex, nuanced world when it comes to um, protecting population when this becomes endemic. So I'm um, switching I, a vacation, but expecting to wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fair. I would take that deal. Um, I have about, again, lots of questions. I would love to keep talking to you for several hours, but you are very busy people, so I will not do that to you. Um, I wanted to thank you all so much for joining um, Future Tense and the Public Interest Technology Program at New America for joining us for this important discussion. Um, you can follow these three on social media at Helene Gale at Atul underscore Gawandi and at Hannah Shank. For more Future Tense events like our discussion next Tuesday on the future of entertainment, please follow at Future Tense now. Um, stay safe, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. And thank you again for joining us. Great to thank be you, with everybody. everybody. Thank you. Yeah.